let's talk a little bit more about that first stage. John talks about it. There's two different aspects of it you need to kind of begin to wrestle with. I almost said understand, but let's just talk about wrestling with it. How about that? One of them is universal and objective. The other is personal and subjective. Right? So let's do them in order. Number one, God gives himself in a way that is universal to everyone and objective. Where is that in the text of Scripture? Take a look with me at verse 8. Talking about John the Baptist, he himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. We all know the light is Jesus. Amen? Right? We're good? Jesus is the light. The true light, verse 9, which enlightens who? Everyone was coming into the world. So whatever happens when Jesus shows up, he says there's this reality that when Jesus shows up in a dark world, he is the light that illumines who? Everyone. All people. That's why I say it is objective and universal. That does not mean everyone gets to that place of justification. He's already said there's a group who receive power to become children. That's that second stage in the journey we're talking about. This is the initial stage. Jesus shows up and His incarnation, His birth, His presence cr creates a fundamental, objective, universal change in the world. Like when Jesus shows up, it's not a one event that happens off in Bethlehem without implications. It has implications that are universal. Things are different when Jesus is born. Things are different when He comes out of the tomb on Easter morning. New creation is launched. And that has a universal impact. I don't understand it. I don't know how it works. I can't answer all the questions. But we are told that the light that Jesus brings illumines everyone. Now there are some people who don't appreciate the language of, of provenient grace. And I get the arguments. And they say, well this is illumination, but we're not talking about salvation. And I think the problem with that is, if you read through the Gospel of John is that the language of light is aimed at faith and becoming a part of God's family. Chapter 1, verse 7, John came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. Why did he testify to the light? So that people could what? Have faith in the light. Why did he testify to the coming of Jesus? So that people could trust Jesus and be joined to him. Whatever illumination that Jesus brings is about salvation. It's not a separate category. Whatever illumination that Jesus brings is aimed at our salvation. It's not a different thing. In chapter 12, verses 35 and 36, John's Gospel, it's doing a little correlation here. Jesus is engaged in some conversation with the crowd, and He says to them, the light is with you for a little longer, talking about Himself. Verse 35, walk while you have the light, so that the darkness may not overtake you. If you walk in the darkness, you don't know where you're going, while you have the light, but believe in the light so that you may become children of light. So you see that movement. The light has come into the world. The appropriate response to the light is trust and belief. And the consequence of that is what? Becoming children of God. So whatever light means, it's part of the path to salvation. It's not a different thing. So Jesus somehow, mysteriously and wisely, illumines everyone. Some people remain in darkness other people walk in the light and become a part of the family of God. So you've got at one level this universal, the light illumines everybody. Thanks be to God. And then you've got this personal subjective. When Paul shows up in a town and starts talking about Jesus, things start to happen. The Spirit goes to work. Individually, subjectively, drawing people to Christ. What does this look like? A couple more kind of illustrative texts. One is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. Paul says to the Thessalonians, For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that He's chosen you, because our message of the Gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. So what is Paul saying? He's saying, I showed up in Thessalonica, started preaching the Gospel. The Word. When I preached the Word, it wasn't a typical kind of like news report or, hey, did you catch the game last night? Those are regular conversations. This is a different kind of conversation. It comes with power. It comes with the Holy Spirit, and it comes with conviction. And Paul is recognizing this reality that when the gospel is preached, right? So you've got this universal change, and then you have this personal and subjective reality that when we just talk about Jesus with individuals, 
the Holy Spirit works powerfully to convict of sin and draw them to Jesus. They're not Christians yet, right? He just showed up. They're not justified. They're not born again. They don't even know Paul, but he's out there talking about Jesus and the Holy Spirit is at work. To see how this kind of plays out a bit. And it's Acts chapter 2. Pentecost. Peter and the other disciples get filled with the Holy Spirit. So what do they do? Peter starts preaching. And he preaches about Jesus. He talks about the death and resurrection of Jesus. He talks about the universal lordship of Jesus. And we are told in verse 37, after the sermon gets through, when they heard this, so there's people listening, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Right? They're not converted yet, are they? They're under conviction. And Luke says they've been cut to the heart. Something supernatural is happening. Sounds a lot like Paul. When we preached, the Holy Spirit worked with power to produce conviction. So Paul, you've got kind of just a, a, an account. And with Acts, we have a narrative. But it's the same reality. They heard the Gospel they were cut to the heart. They didn't just go, you know, I'm going to think about this for a little while and kind of reflect on it and I'll weigh the options. No, the Spirit of God worked in their lives when the gospel is preached. That's grace that comes before conversion, grace that comes before new birth, grace that comes before justification. The Spirit works in their lives. They're cut to the heart and they ask, like, what do we do? Because <laughs> they don't know. But they're what little bit of light they have, they're responding. And so Peter instructs them, repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins may be forgiven. So that your sins may be forgiven. We're still in that initial stage, aren't we? But Jesus is giving Himself through the preaching of the Gospel and the conviction of the Holy Spirit and drawing them in. And what happens? They get baptized. They join the covenant. They confess, they trust Jesus, and they are added to the number of the children of God. What I want you to see, and this is crucial, we're talking about grace. Now, grace isn't something we get, it's a person we know. This is Jesus who works both universally and particularly to give Himself. Whatever giving of Himself He gives to you, Respond. Nobody initiates anything with Jesus. No one. He always comes first. That's why John the Baptist shows up, doesn't it? Isn't it? John chapter 1. He prepares the way. That's provenient grace. He precedes Jesus. There's a light coming. There's somebody coming. The one is coming. He's greater than I am. We get this again and again and again. That God initiates. He initiates. We don't initiate. He initiates. We respond. And what are we responding to? Not some substance, but Him. His life, His person, His being, His love, His perfect love for us.